Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Understanding Holocaust History Lecture, our weekly series that we're doing on Thursday afternoons. Today's topic is Jewish Faith and the Holocaust, and our presenter today will be Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, our Chief Education, Programs, and Exhibitions Officer at the Museum. My name is Annie Black. I'm the Director of Programs at the Museum, and we're happy to have you with us. Uh, just a couple of logistical things before I introduce Sarah. We will have time for, at the end of her presentation for question and answer from you all. So just take a moment, if you would, and locate your Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if you want to type a question in there, again, Sarah will get to questions at the end of the program, but you're welcome to type them in whenever you think of them. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson. Thank you, Annie, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really actually pretty excited about uh, this particular uh, presentation. This is a, a complete, uh, completely new area for me. Um, so thank you for, for being my test audience for this. Um, I hope you ask lots of questions. I can't promise that I'll be able to answer them. But uh, I, I have my, my pen and my, and my uh, pad, so I'll definitely take notes because it'll, it'll help me to, to uh, think uh, this material through uh, in a more kind of concrete fashion. So uh, what I want to do uh, is share my screen with you. And I am going to share my PowerPoint. OK, um, so uh, this presentation is, is titled Jewish Practice and the Holocaust, and these are initial thoughts. And what motivated me uh, in thinking about this talk was that we always hear about Jews in the context of the Nazi regime and the Holocaust and the years of 33 to 45, frequently from a perpetrator's perspective, certainly from the perspective of Jews being victims, but we never hear about it from the perspective of Jews being Jews, meaning going about age old religious practice, going about maintaining their culture, their lives, and really the world as they have known it and understood it for more than two millennia. And so what I wanted to do today was to begin to just share some of my initial thoughts about that and start to, to kind of unpack what that might mean. So I, I wanted uh, to start by giving you the essential elements of traditional Judaism. Um, and by traditional Judaism, I mean what today we would call Orthodox Judaism, but I want you to be aware of the fact that Orthodox Judaism, which is the most traditional of all forms of Judaism and is really the form of Judaism that existed with changes from the temple period all the way through the very early 19th century. So really the very uh, first decade of the 1800s, when we talked about Judaism, we didn't talk about orthodoxy. We talked about traditional Judaism because there wasn't anything else. What happens in the early 19th century is that you have the emergence of reform Judaism. And then later in the 19th century, you have the emergence of what, what today we would call conservative Judaism. The reason I'm focusing on traditional Judaism is because something that frequently gets overlooked when we talk about Jews who went through the, the Holocaust, who experienced the tender mercies of, uh, and obviously tongue in cheek, of, of, the, of the Nazi regime, more than 50% of those Jews were traditional Jews. And what's absolutely fascinating to me, and I have some thoughts as to why this is, which we can possibly get into in the question and answer period, is that of the museums around the world, that deal with the Holocaust, there is only one, and there are, there are several dozen museums worldwide, there is only one museum in the entire world that deals with the Holocaust from the perspective of Orthodox traditional Jews and what they experienced. 
uh, and we'll come back to that, but that museum, and it's a small museum, exists in Borough Park, which is a small, uh, heavily religious enclave of southwestern Brooklyn. So it's a, it's a uh, two zip codes is what it is. Um, about 130,000 people live there, but we'll come back to that. So in talking about traditional Judaism, what are we talking about? Well, the first things we need to talk about are the kind of three major elements that all religious Jews, regardless of whether they're modern Orthodox and, you know, we're, we're what would look to you like, you know, kind of modern, modern street clothes, uh, probably not slacks, although that's even permissible in some modern Orthodox circles, to ultra, ultra Orthodox, who would include, um, uh, Hasidic uh, movements, people who follow rabbinic dynasties, uh, people people who who in many ways keep to themselves and live in their own neighborhoods because they don't really want to interact with the outside world. Um, all of these groups follow the following three uh, areas. First of all, they are all engaged in keeping the Sabbath. From shortly before sundown, uh, Friday night, through to almost an hour after sundown Saturday evening, they are strictly off the grid, uh, meaning that they don't turn on and off electricity, they don't drive, they don't do things that would either create or destroy. Um, and they are very, very strict about this. So that's one thing, Sabbath observance. As part of that, they also are strictly observant in terms of their holidays and the Jewish holiday cycle. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. The second thing that they all do is they maintain kashrut, they keep kosher, they maintain the Jewish dietary laws. And that runs the gamut from not eating certain foods uh, that are prohibited to keeping separate sets of dishes, um, to making sure that you follow all of those rules as originally laid down in the Torah, you know, the five books of Moses and subsequently expanded upon or expounded upon uh, by rabbinical authorities. The third thing that all traditional Jews, all religious Jews is, do is if they are married and the woman is still within her childbearing years, by which I mean she still has has her menses, she still gets her, her monthly period, they practice what's called taharat hamishpacha, or family purity. And what this entails is the woman from the time she uh, first gets her period until seven days after her period has completely stopped, uh, will have no contact with her husband. Um, and again, because we're talking about from modern orthodox all the way to ultra orthodoxy, that no contact with her husband can run the gamut from simply keeping to their own sides of a king size bed and not having, you know, sexual relations during this 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 time of usually about fourteen days, to going so far as to pass things at the dining table when they sit together and they're ultra orthodox. And the woman or the husband will pick up the salt cellar, for example, put it to the middle of the table and let the other person in their couple pick it up because the woman is ritually impure and neither side wants to violate this notion of family purity. And again, this is ritual impurity. Please don't think that this has anything to do with the fact that a woman is bleeding, being, being unclean, you know, the way we think of soap and water. It, it, that, that is not the issue. But anyway, so those are the three uh, major elements that I would call the principal areas that all uh, traditional Jews uh, follow. Then there is a secondary er area, um, which they have to do which really is a natural outgrowth of that first set of, of three. The second principal areas are prayer and minyan. And by this, what we mean specifically are that Jewish men are required to pray three times a day. And if at all possible, they are supposed to do this within a prayer quorum, meaning a group of 10 men of the age of 13 or above. The reason for this is that there are certain um, practices Judaically that you can only 
undertake if you are in this group of 10 men. Uh, one would be the Amida repetition, which is the, the, um, the prayer that said during the day um, that uh, can only be repeated with certain, certain um, uh, sanctifications of the holy name, sanctifications of God's name, if you are in a group of 10 men. The second uh, thing that, that you can only do in a minion is to officially recite the Kaddish. And it's not that people don't recite Kaddish to themselves, the, the prayer for the dead under their breath, but it is uh, considered much more powerful if it is done in a group of 10 men. And then the third thing that you have to do in a minion, so in a group of 10 or more men, is the reading of the Torah scroll, both the Sabbath reading and the weekly reading, uh, several days during the week when you read smaller portions of what you're going to go ahead and read on, on the Sabbath. Those can only be done within a group of 10 men. So, so, so that minyan is, and that getting together of that group is very, very important. Also essential to Judaism is keeping of the 613 mitzvot. Um, and let's be very clear that these mitzvot, today they talk about them as being a good deed. Oh, I did a mitzvah, I did a good deed. You may in fact have done a good deed, but if you did a mitzvah, in fact, what you did was you performed one of the 613 commandments that govern Jewish religious life. Um, those 613 commandments include two things. They include mitzvot or commandments of omission. Those are your thou shalt nots. And they uh, include uh, other mitzvot of commission. Those are your thou shalt. So those are the basic ways that you break them down. I, I should add to this that there's about 100 of these 613 that nobody who's religious and Jewish today can perform because they relate to practices that were only possible when the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was in existence. So when religious Jews talk about keeping the Tarayag mitzvot, which is the, 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 the Hebrew lettering, uh, the, the um, uh, equivalent to the number 613, they all know that they can't. It, it's a physical impossibility today, but that's, that, that's the aspiration. The third thing in the second area is the study of Torah called limud. And Jews are called to study the Torah. And although, by the way, I've been mentioning men in all of this, I want to be very clear that there are mitzvot, there are commandments that women are called to maintain and to keep. There is Torah study, which women cannot necessarily do um, at, the, at the Torah scroll in an Orthodox setting the way men do, but women study Torah as well. Today, Orthodox women study Talmud. Today, Orthodox women, I mean, there are thousands of women who study virtually, even before we moved into our COVID virtuality, Orthodox Jewish women who study the Talmud together virtually all over the world. So, so, so be aware that, that there is a, a, a female component to all of this. And then the final thing that I wanted to give you is kind of the exception to all of these rules, to all of these requirements Judaically, to keeping family purity, to keeping kosher, to observing the Sabbath and the holidays, to keeping the 613 mitzvot, to the prayer and the minyan and the Torah study. The exception is what we call pikuach nefesh, which is a fascinating concept and I'm going to only touch, I'm not even scraping the surface. I'm just going to basically translate for you and then we're going to move on. So pikuach nefesh means saving a life or saving a soul. And Judaically, the accepted halacha, so the accepted Jewish law is that all bets are off regarding all of these things that I've just detailed for you if doing them would prevent you from saving a Jewish life, and that life can be your own. So what this should say to you is that in the context of the Holocaust, in the context of the horrors that Jews went through during uh, the Holocaust, there are many, many, many rabbinical sources and responsa that essentially say you did not have to keep kosher. You did not have to maintain family purity. You did not have to pray uh, in a minion. You did not have to study Torah if it was a tremendous threat to your life. 
Now, the reason I say many, many, many is because there's always outliers and Judaism is nothing if not an argumentative uh, legally based religion. And there were some rabbinic outliers who said, the heck with all of that, no matter what, because the Nazis are attempting to destroy everything that Judaism represents, including its people, you must observe the commandments regardless. But, but again, I want to, I want to point out that that really is the outlier. And that brings us really to uh, the next area uh, that I want to quickly talk about, which is um, the traditional Jewish approach to history. So I'm a, I'm a Jew. I'm a traditional Jew. I'm also a historian. So I'm kind of a weird bird because I have a foot in both camps. The traditional Jewish approach to history is taken within the context of Judaism. You don't stand outside of Judaism and look at, for example, um, the Jewish holidays and talk about the three uh, um, pilgrimage holidays, uh, uh, Sukkot and, uh, or, or um, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks and um, uh, uh, Passover or Pesach, uh, really the Feast of Freedom and, the, and, and, and the, the, the Exodus, you don't look at those and say, you know, Judaism is an ancient Near Eastern religion. It emerges from an ancient Near Eastern uh, ambiance. And so each one of those, interestingly, corresponds to either harvest or planting or fertility. Huh, how fascinating. No, a religious Jew looks at those and says, we celebrate these holidays because these holidays were given to us at the foot of Mount Sinai as part of the giving of the Torah and the law from God to Moses and on and on and on and on. So they look at this very differently. That's why I call it the Mobius strip concept of history or a lived cycle. When you think of a Mobius strip, you can't stand outside of it. You can only be endlessly inside of its cycle. And that's how religious Jews, for the most part, observe Jewish history. To the extent that they know Jewish history, they know it because of the Jewish holidays and the annual Jewish holiday cycle that they uh, undertake. And the mention of all kinds of things that have occurred to Jews over the millennia in the Jewish liturgy, in the Jewish prayer cycle. So what I really want you to take from all of this is that Judaism is an extremely time-bound and time aware religion. Um, and because of that, the Jewish day is sp split into various times when you pray, various times when you do certain activities. The Jewish calendar or year is split into thousands of minute segments of time that are used to calculate long before we had calculators or, or supercomputers that were used, you know, a 1500 years ago to calculate precisely what the time of prayer was, when the holidays would occur, when the holidays would occur in the diaspora versus when the holidays would occur in the state of Israel. It's very, very complex, but it's a very different approach to history than we as historians or as secular people would take. So I wanted very quickly to just give you the, the list of the major Jewish holidays that are observed by all religious Jews and many uh, uh, conservative Jews, reform Jews, and even some cultural Jews, although they'll, they'll frequently uh, pick and choose or maybe observe one day in the diaspora and not two. Every one of these holidays, again, runs from sunset to sunset plus 50 minutes. So I said an hour. I gave us 10 minutes just in case. So the first two holidays I have on here are Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. There's a 10-day period between those two holy days, which represent what we call the high holidays, um, which is um, Yemei Tshuva, the, the days of repentance, or in core, kind of more modern American parlance, uh, 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 Yomim Noraim, which means um, uh, uh, days of awe. So those are the first two. The next three are the three pilgrimage holidays uh, that I mentioned. Sukkot, or the Feast of Booths, is 
in memory of the time that Jews spent in the desert living in these kinds of, of hut-like uh, um, uh, domiciles. Um, I would also point out that uh, it is in uh, the fall, and so it is also <laughs> harvest time, but don't tell anybody. Uh, Passover, which is always the spring, represents the exodus and the freedom of the Jews. So it's considered a, um, a uh, holiday of, of, of liberty. And Passover happens to be around the time of planting. Again, and again, we're going by, by dates in, in, in these times in ancient Israel. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and Passover is not the time of planting in Western New York. It's still snow time. Um, the third of those holidays is Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, and it's significant because that is when the Jews believe that they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai and received uh, the Torah. Um, it's usually in uh, mid-May to early June. It also happens to be in Israel and the ancient Near East, the time of the receipt of the first harvest, of the first planting of crops for the year. And again, that's just for, for your information. Additionally, there's five fast days that all Orthodox Jews uh, follow. Those are beside Yom Kippur uh, and the Day of Atonement. Three of them relate to the stages of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 67 AD. So remember I said that Jewish practice, if you're an Orthodox Jew, has a long historical memory and cycle, even though you go through it every year. So in the Jewish cycle, three of those fasts take you back to 67 AD. The other two fasts take you back to the period between about 590 BC and 519 BC, so during the period in which the first temple had been destroyed and the second temple wasn't rebuilt. So again, there's a long historical sensibility in Judaism. And then I added uh, three additional holidays that are observed by all religious Jews, but they're all uh, rabbinical in nature. One is Purim, uh, or the, what you know of as the Book of Esther. I said lots because Purim are the lots uh, that were drawn to see to see you know which Jews would die first uh, uh, from Haman at the hand of Haman. One is Simchat Torah, uh, which is the start of the annual Torah reading cycle. When you get to the end of the Torah, uh, it's usually late September, early October, and you begin again at the beginning of the Torah. You, you begin with Genesis and you start all over again. So again, that that cycle that you never leave. And then the final one is Hanukkah. Uh, which is the rededication of the temple. And no, it's not a rabbi, a rabbinical holiday the way we understand it today. It's a holiday that was done by the priestly class when the temple uh, was still in existence, but it's rabbinical nonetheless. So those three do not come to us from the Torah. Okay, so that was the, the kind of background thinking to all of this. So what I wanted to do now is get into calendars which helped people maintain their faith when they were under uh, Nazi control or when they were under can uh, in hiding. So the first calendar here on the left-hand side was created by uh, Rabbi Yaakov Avigdor. He was a Hasidic rabbi, and he was a rabbinical leader from Galicia, which today is uh, Ukraine. Uh, at the time, it would have been um, Poland and uh, uh, Russia. And he composed a Jewish calendar in every camp in which he was uh, incarcerated or imprisoned, but they were all destroyed. The only one that survived was the one that he created for the Hebrew year 5705. Uh, and that was the year 1944, 1945. That was when he was in Buchenwald concentration camp. And these up here are the days of, or excuse me, the names of the Hebrew months. So each of the months goes through. Then he breaks it down by, by um, uh, Hebrew days. He also breaks it down by, by uh, the days of the non-Jewish calendar, and he breaks it down by days of the Jewish calendar. This is only one part of it, but, but these calendars are very complex. The second calendar that you see over here 
was done by Rabbi Asher Berlinger, and it was done by him when he was in Theresienstadt. So when he was in Czechoslovakia in the Theresienstadt ghetto slash deportation camp, because it also served as a waiting room for Auschwitz, amongst other things. And um, he uh, did in this booklet, uh, Jewish calendars for the years 43-44 and 44-45, uh, he and his wife, Brindel, did not survive. They were both deported and murdered in Auschwitz. Yad Vashem is the repository for all of these. Um, and I just grabbed some of them that I thought were most illustrative. The difference is this one is all in Hebrew lettering with the names of the Hebrew months. Um, his is in Hebrew and in German. So he does the uh, German days of the month. I mean, basically it's Monday, Monday through, through Sunday. Um, and then these weird times, remember I said that, that days can be divided into numerous little segments of time. So what he's doing is calculating precisely when and where he needs to celebrate his holidays. Then this is the third calendar that I wanted to show you. Uh, this was done in early 1943. Uh, it says 42 here, but it's the Jewish year going from 42 to 43. Again, the Jewish year is split because the Jewish year starts September, October, as opposed to the Christian year that begins in January and runs through December. So there's always that overlap. This was done by Rabbi Shlomo Yisrael Schneiner, Schneiner, who was a Hasid from Neustadt. And he and his wife uh, and their four children uh, spent two months hiding in uh, the forests uh, in, in the Polish borderlands. And then they were taken in by a Catholic former employee of theirs uh, a, a woman named Machis was her last name in Dombrova, Poland. And while they were in her home, Rabbi Shiner and his family, they survived, created uh, these uh, calendars. These calendars uh, were, uh, these are fe featured on a Chabad website, but these calendars are also are housed uh, at Yad Vashem. The next picture I wanted to show you, because we're talking about Jewish observance and the fact that the Nazis are out there. This horror is all around you. But Jews who are religious, not all of them, but many of them continue to practice their cycles and their history and their, and their religion in spite of what surrounds them. So this is a picture of Shabbos. And I said Shabbos instead of Shabbat because these, these were, were Yiddish speaking and Jews. So this is what they would have called it. This is Shabbos in the Ludge ghetto around 1942. Uh, just a few things for you to notice. First of all, they're in a group of men, which leads me to believe that they had gotten together secretly to have a minion to welcome in the Shabbat. Um, you see that they have the yellow stars on them. Ludge is aberrational for much of Poland. In Poland, if you think back to the photos you've seen, you will generally see people with an armband, a white armband with a blue star of David on it. Ludge is the exception to that rule. Ludge, like a lot of the rest of occupied Europe, the Jews wore yellow stars. And frequently they wore a yellow star on the front of their, you know, uh, their clothing and on the back. The other thing that I thought was interesting about this is that they, they didn't have two candlesticks, they had a single candlestick. Um, and it's a very interesting crowd to give you a sense of the mixture of orthodoxy. This gentleman is traditionally orthodox. Uh, one of the, the tip-offs is the untrimmed beard. This gentleman is orthodox, but probably heading to modern orthodoxy. He keeps his beard trim. And <laughs> this gentleman and this gentleman are definitely modern orthodox, wearing modern clothing and, and clean shaven. So again, to give you a sense of the spectrum that you could see. This photo, also from 1941, was very interesting. And this comes, again, from Yad Vashem. What we frequently forget about is that the Warsaw Ghetto, because it is the largest ghetto in all of occupied Europe, um, uh, at its peak having between 450,000 and 500,000 Jews in it, is also the home of many Jewish refugees from outside of Warsaw, from the rest of Poland, who are forced into Warsaw um, and into the ghetto there. And there's no place for them to live. And so the Jews of Warsaw, in spite of the fact that they themselves are starving to, to death, 
honor one of the principal um, uh, commandments uh, that Jews um, are, are ordered to do, which is called hachnasat orchim, or the welcoming of, of the visitor or the stranger. And so they set up refugee shelters. This woman is bringing in the Sabbath at a refugee shelter, which means that she was not from Warsaw. She's from somewhere outside of Warsaw. She's making do. She manages one candlestick and one overturned, a candle holder, excuse me, and one overturned um, glass. She clearly is having somebody join her, but you can see that that this is, this is make do at best. Um, but again, people do what they can do to, to maintain their traditions. Here, We've moved to uh, Wieleczka, Poland, um, a, a, a smaller town in Poland. And this is a Purim spiel, which is just another uh, name for a Purim uh, uh, play that Jews regularly do to this day within uh, Orthodox circles. Uh, this is all children. And the plays are usually comedic and usually imaginative, but they somehow wrap the story of Esther and Mordecai or Esther and Mordecai and the defeat of Haman into all, all of that story. And so the end is that always that the Jews emerge victorious and Haman is defeated. The reason I picked this particular photo is because Wieliczka was very unusual. When the Germans approached Wieliczka in 39, many Jewish men were murdered when, when the Germans arrived. And Wieliczka becomes the only town that I am aware of that had an all-female Judenrat or an all-female Jew Jewish council that was the liaison council between people who lived in the ghetto and people uh, and, and the Nazi uh, authorities themselves. Um, and women were assigned to forced labor as well. Some men ultimately returned to the ghetto uh, who hadn't been, been killed, um, but by August of 42, so uh, a few months after this photo is taken, many of the Jews in um, Yelichka are rounded up and they are sent to the, the Belzich uh, uh, death camp, one of the Operation Reinhardt death camps. Here's another uh, uh, ghetto. This is the Ludge ghetto. The Ludge ghetto was the longest uh, ghetto in existence of any of uh, the ghettos um, in uh, the East. And again, here children are celebrating Purim. You, you dress up as your favorite character uh, from um, uh, the uh, Book of Esther or, or Megillat Esther as it's called. Here is another way in which Purim is observed. So Purim is read, uh, the, the story of Purim is read from the Megillat Esther, the, the, the um, scroll of Esther. And this is a classic Purim scroll. This Purim scroll uh, was uh, found in Theresienstadt. Um, it was in the possession of Avraham Adolf Hellman, who was a Jew from Bruno, Czechoslovakia. And in Theresienstadt, he served as a cantor for services that were held in the Sudeten Kaserna Synagogue. It's an interesting name for a synagogue. Sudeten is the section of um, Czechoslovakia that was earliest turned over to the Germans uh, after the Munich Accord in 38. So that's the Sudetenland. Kaserna means barracks. And in fact, if you'll think back, Theresienstadt was an original old Habsburg imperial city inside of a barracks. Uh, it, so it's a military barracks city. And so this is telling you that his synagogue was actually in the Sudeten barracks uh, uh, here. He also uh, brought a shofar, uh, the, the traditional uh, horn and a prayer shawl to the ghetto. And I just wanted to share with you on the eve of Yom Kippur, 1944, he stood on the train platform waiting to be deported to Auschwitz with thousands of others because people were regularly deported from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz. It was the model uh, ghetto and that was, the big, that was the big Nazi line. And his wife Charlotte remembers in a testimony, she survived, he did not, um, that her husband said, it's time to pray. He put down his suitcases. He covered himself with his talus. 
he stood with another friend of his and another acquaintance from Bohemia, another section of, um, of Czechoslovakia, and they began to pray. And the fascinating thing about this is that all of the men and the women, and there were thousands out there, took up the prayer. Uh, they began to say the Kol Nidre, which is the, the opening prayer uh, as you ask for forgiveness and you atone for your sins. Um, she said people from all over Theresen came, even though they weren't part of this deportation, to join these prayers. Um, at the end, she said, the women returned to their rooms because this was mostly men in this deportation and they couldn't sleep because they kept waiting for the deportation train whistle, which didn't come until the next day at 6 a.m. So again, these things show you Jews being Jews and, and maintaining who they are in their identity no matter what. I wanted to show you a picture of him uh, and his wife, uh, Charlotte. Uh, so this is Avraham Adolf Hellman, because I wanted to give you, uh, to give a face to this. This is a handwritten book of Esther, plus uh, amusing camp stories uh, that came to us from a camp in uh, Transylvania, which was Romania at the time. Uh, Ilya was the area. Um, and in fact, the man who wrote this, who was a bit of a jokester, uh, it's written in, in, in uh, Yiddish, much of, the, much of the story, and his son survived. And his son gave testimony years later uh, when he donated this to Yad Vashem um, about the fact that they used to actually sing this this year. They gathered around the Jews in this camp and they sang this play on the Purim story that incorporated the story of Jewish inmates in it. And in the Yad Vashem Shem testimony, he actually, he remembers and he sings it out loud. So it's, it's, it's very moving. The next major holiday I wanted to cover was Passover. And Passover is significant for Jews at all times in, in uh, not just when they're ghettoized or under, under terrible um, uh, ex, uh, you know, suffering, but at all times because Passover is the holiday through which the Jews become a nation. It's also the holiday through which the Exodus occurs and Jews become free. And so here you have Jews uh, baking matzah in a secret matzah bakery in the Warsaw Ghetto because matzah and the breaking of matzah and the eating of matzah for the eight days in the diaspora, seven days in Israel of uh, Passover is utterly vital. And what I should probably be very clear on is that the Germans forbade religious services in most ghettos. So most of the photos that you see of Jewish in prayer were held in secrets in cellars and attics and back rooms, very occasionally uh, in synagogues, and others would stand guard outside these rooms. You also need to know that in Warsaw alone, more than 600 minyanim, more than 600 prayer quora existed at any one time within the city. Um, and, and that's a mile square, give or take, area of, of the ghetto. Um, and there were rabbinical authorities in all of these areas because there was always a rabbi who was in these ghettos. And when religious Jews were bereft or just didn't know how to respond or what to do, they would frequently go to the rabbis to ask for religious guidance. You know, should I do this? Should I do that? How do I do this? How do I do that? And the other thing that they always do is they pray because this is how they sustain morale. This is another hidden matzah bakery. This one is in the Lodge Ghetto. Uh, this is 1943. And then um, here we have, and I, I love this one because, because this is showing you after they have gotten away. So these were Jews who managed to escape from Lublin, which is where Majdanek was, but there was also a ghetto in Lublin. They made it behind Russian lines. So they're now in Russia proper. And what do they do in 43? They create a mobile, because it looks like they're in some sort of a forest encampment, so they may be with partisans, but they create a mobile matzah bakery. Um, so, so they continue to carry on the tradition. 
This is early days in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, this is 1940. And this is matzah distribution within the ghetto. Um, this was done publicly as opposed to the baking, which was done privately. I have not seen explanations as to how this is handled with the Germans here, but I know that there were annual matzah distributions. So I don't know if the Germans simply chose to look the other way um, or, or, or how this was, this was handled. It's something that I'll, I'll have to, as I said, do more research on. This is that same refugee uh, shelter that you saw before. Um, this one is, uh, it's at 6th Lezno Street in, Wars in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it is a Passover Seder being held with a bunch of people who are refugees in, in the ghetto. But again, they continue to maintain their religious practice. Here we have a uh, Passover um, Seder that was held in a French internment camp uh, slash transit camp. The Jews from this camp, which was closed in 43, were almost all deported to Auschwitz and murdered. Um, this is Bonne uh, bon la Roland. But again, in both the East and the West, Jews maintain their practice as much as they can. And then this is a Passover Haggadah, so the actual telling of the tale of Exodus, this is the first page of it. This was written by a um, boy who at the time would have been 14 years old. He was born in 1930. He was Belgian. Um, and he and his brother lived in Antwerp, and they had to go into hiding uh, when, uh, when the Germans invaded uh, Belgium. Um, they ended up um, uh, going from Belgium ultimately to France. Um, and then in the fall 1942, the family is arrested in France. The grandparents who are with the, the mother, father, and the two boys, uh, the family name, by the way, is Jakunt. Uh, they are, grandparents are uh, sent to Auschwitz from France and murdered in October of 42. The husband ultimately is caught uh, in a, a roundup in Belgium, and he is sent to the uh, Mechelen transit camp, which is the deportation uh, station, next step Auschwitz. The mother and the two boys survive the war, and they survive the war um, hidden uh, by a Catholic family um, in... Um, uh, in Belgium in a village called Genoval, and they make it through the war. As part of the assignments that the mother assigned to her boys to maintain their religiosity, both boys um, wrote Haggadah uh, uh, um, uh, and illustrated them, Haggadot, while they were in hiding. This is Ephraim Zev Yakont, the, the older brother, and there was a younger brother as well. This, now we move into Rosh Hashanah. Um, is a really interesting uh, item. This is uh, uh, the, called the Wolfsburg Machzor because um, it was done in Wolfsburg, Germany. So what happened was Naftali Stern was from Transylvania, uh, Romania. He, along with his family, was deported to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, he um, was uh, separated from his wife and his four young children. They were gassed. He then was sent to the forced labor camp of Wolfsburg in Germany. And he wrote the New Year's prayers from memory with a stub of a pencil on a piece of cement bag, which he acquired in exchange for bread. And when you're starving to death, that, that is a big deal. The Germans allowed the inmates in the camp to gather together and hold prayers for the new year. And so this machzor, this uh, prayer uh, book for Yom Kippur, or excuse me, for, for Rosh Hashanah was actually used. And Stern um, also served as the cantor um, because he had been a cantor before uh, when he was back in um, Romania, Transylvania. He wore this on his body until liberation. He, he hid it and continued to pray from it each year for New Year's. Um, after the war, he moved to Israel. He uh, established a new family there. 
40 years after liberation, he realized that the pages and the printing were beginning to degrade, and so he donated this to Yad Vashem. Um, but this became part of his religious practice. This um, is from Piotrkov, Poland, um, and I included it because uh, one of our board members uh, and his wife uh, uh, were born to parents who survived the Piotrkov um, ghetto and, and moved eastward. Um, the idea for this was uh, started by a rabbi uh, who was incarcerated in the uh, Skarzysko Kamiena forced labor camp, which was the labor camp attacked to Piotrkov, Poland. Um, he had to bribe a Polish guard to get him a ram's horn, because that's what you make a shofar from. Uh, the guard screwed up uh, and brought him um, the horn of an ox. And so the rabbi said, no, no, this won't do. They had to give him a further bribe and the guard went out this time and found a ram's horn. The rabbi then approached, approached uh, an inmate, Mosher Vinterter, who uh, worked in the metal workshop preparing armaments. And this was dangerous. Um, it took some convincing because to be caught doing this in the armaments shop was a death sentence. But Moshe Vinterter agreed to uh, ultimately carry out the task. He got the shofar on the eve of Rosh Hashanah 1943 uh, to the rabbi. Word spread throughout the camp and the inmates gathered to hear the sound of this shofar. And this shofar then was blown at this forced labor camp outside of Pyotrkov. Um, when um, uh, the rabbi was transferred out, Vinterter kept the shofar with him. He was transferred first to a camp in Chenstachova, later to Buchenwald, and it remained in Chenstachova until it was liberated. At that time, the shofar was passed on to the local Jewish community, taken to the US, and it remained with a family in the US. Moshe Vinterter, the original maker who had been in the uh, armaments factory uh, or, or camp, immigrated to Israel after the war. And in 1977, he made the connection between the family in the United States who had the shofar and Yad Vashem, and it was donated to Yad Vashem. Here, a picture of Jews in a minion preparing for the most holy prayer of the year, the Yom Kippur prayer in the Krakow ghetto. Here, Jews, both women and men in the, in the Lodz ghetto. Again, you know, you can tell it's Lodz again because of the stars. Uh, in a public street preparing uh, to, to pray. Here in the Lublin area, so Majdanek area of Poland in 42, religious Jews sitting in a sukkah because that is one of the commandments that you're supposed to fulfill. Here in the day, Simchat Torah, when we, in, in the fall, when we, we end the reading of the Torah and begin the cycle again, you have a Zionist youth group dancing with the Torah in the Lodz ghetto. Here, different uh, camera angle, same group, and you have multiple Torahs that they're dancing with. And in spite of the fact that this is a grim time, they're happy. Um, here you have the observance of Hanukkah. Uh, this is Vesterbork, so this is in the West. So this is Jews from the West before they get deported, celebrating the seventh night of Hanukkah out of eight in the diaspora. Here in the Lodz ghetto in 43, again, this is a Hanukkah um, uh, party, and they go so far as to say Chag HaMakabim instead of Hanukkah. So they're saying the, ho the holiday of the Maccabees because the Maccabees, the Maccabees struck a blow for Jewish freedom. So again, very conscious of what they're doing. The, um, one of the final areas I wanted to show you is just that in the middle of all of this, the reading of the Torah, the study of the Torah keeps up and juxtapose this against what we always see, which is piles of destroyed Torahs, piles of Torahs that have been desecrated on purpose by the Germans. But the fact remains that in spite of all of that, as much as they could, the Jews continue to read Torah. 
This is 4344 in the Lodge ghetto and the bringing in of a new Torah that has been written in the ghetto. So a Torah scribe in the ghetto wrote this and they're dancing and singing as this new Torah is dedicated. Here is a Torah uh, study class. Um, this would have had to have taken place in secret, again, in the ghetto. Um, and here, and this one is particularly moving for me, uh, Rabbi Chaim Halevi Rabinovich of Yasi, Romania, uh, where the Romanians themselves had a pogrom and murdered many of their, of their Jewish citizens. This rabbi and his son survived that pogrom by playing dead, but then were rounded up afterwards to be deported to a death camp. He grabbed a Torah scroll with him to take the Torah scroll as his last um, kind of connection to Judaism. The final thing I wanted to show you is the secret synagogue of Theresienstadt. There were multiple synagogues in multiple locations in Theresienstadt. This one is the only one that has its decorations on one of the walls that remains. Um, and this was uh, run by Artur Berlinger, whom we mentioned earlier. And uh, Berlinger and uh, his wife, uh, Berta were um, uh, deported in, in fall of 44 to Auschwitz. Between 42 and 44, he created this prayer room, this, this synagogue in an abandoned storage space and conducted regular services here. Um, he wasn't a rabbi, he was, he was a, a cantor. Um, but this was how important it was to people. And here's, here's another scene uh, of that uh, synagogue. So, Again, what I wanted really to do um, is to, to share just some evidence of the vibrancy and the richness of Jewish practice at that time. The other thing I wanted to do, uh, and then I'll open to questions, so just bear with me please one more minute, is to talk about Amud Eish, um, which is uh, the Kleiman Holocaust Museum and Center in Borough Park, uh, Brooklyn. So these two uh, um, zip codes, a small neighborhood in southwestern Brooklyn. Uh, it's been in the news a lot lately because COVID-19 has ripped through the area. Um, this area uh, is 78% Jewish, these, these two zip codes. Uh, that's, so a population of 131,000, 78% of them are Jewish. Of that 78% population, 80% of those Jews are are orthodox to ultra-orthodox. And 14% of those households have at least one Holocaust survivor in them. The majority of those who were murdered in the camps and the ghettos were not secular Jews. They were traditional Jews. And so it is really an important exercise to recover that. That is being done by this organization and, and museum, Amud Eish. And Amud Eish has one of the most spectacular collections of religious Jewish artifacts from pre-war pre and during the war in Europe that I have ever seen. Because these families, these survivors, and it's one of the largest survivor communities in the United States, held on to these objects if they survived the war. And they didn't give them to museums because the museums that approached them weren't religious and didn't focus on Jewish religiosity and Jewish practice in the midst of all of these horrors, and so they refused to give them up. When Amud Eish was founded and began collecting, and it was founded exclusively by Orthodox Jews, it's a fascinating place, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of objects came out of the woodwork in this area in Borough Park. And so they have one of the most spectacular collections of European Judaica uh, that remains from the Holocaust that you have ever seen. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really, really amazing. And so I just wanted to, to, to let you know that one of the reasons Holocaust museums like ours have not in the past covered this material um, is simply because we haven't had the wherewithal. And, and my hope is that that, that is going to begin to, to uh, stop. Um, so uh, uh, as far as questions go, um, Veronique Jonas says, how on earth did they create calendars from memory? And the answer would be from memory, working with secular calendars, working with 
incredibly complex mathematical calculations that are made in the Talmud and in rabbinical literature, which they had hidden with themselves so that they could do these calculations. Um, also, Veronique Jonas points out that in Sephardic observance, only one candle is lit, not two. And I would say to you, absolutely. And also in Sephardic observance, the um, Torah that you read from is not the Torah scroll that we as East, Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews are used to. It comes in a giant um, uh, enameled and ornate case and the case has a hinge and the case opens up and the scroll resides within the case and you, and you read it inside the case. So it's, it's different practice. Having said that though, Veronique, I would, I would put money on the fact that the Jews in that picture um, uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto were Ashkenazi Jews, um, simply because of the, the setting and the locale um, and, and the number of them. Another uh, question from, from Ellen uh, Linoff Ennis, wasn't there a Nazi ruse to provide matzah within a village to bring out the Jews and then murder them? Yes, there was. That was not what this matzah distribution was about, but you are absolutely right that there is at least one story uh, with which I'm familiar in which the Nazis called Jews out for Passover matzah distribution and, and then that, um, that morphed into a, into a deportation. So you're absolutely right. Uh, and Gail Saxon asks, would deportation be different if Jews weren't as observant? Were there not Jews who gave up their religion to live? Um, were there Jews who stopped um, practicing their Judaism in the camps? Absolutely. Were there Jews who stopped practicing their Judaism in the ghettos? Yes, there were some. But the fact remains that the vast majority you know, the overwhelming majority in the ghettos and in the camps came from a traditional Jewish background because they were Eastern European Jews. Um, would giving up their religion enable them to live? I would need more of, from you of what you're, what you're asking, what you're thinking about, because I'm not really sure um, what you're getting at. So Gail, let, let's talk offline, okay? So, I want to thank you very, very much for bearing with me and for your patience, because as I said, this is brand spanking new territory to me. Uh, so I hope that I, that I answered more questions than I raised, and I hope that it was, it was coherent so that, you know, it, it made sense as we went through it. And thank you so much, and uh, we will see you virtually uh, very, very soon.